thank our distinguished panel for these introductory uh, remarks and information. I think we have heard enough about Peter Stone. Uh, I don't need to introduce him any further. Just uh, add that uh, Professor Stone holds the UNESCO Chair in Cultural Property Protection and Peace at the University of Newcastle. So I would like to welcome him today, tonight uh, for giving his lecture and just kindly ask you to switch off your mobile phone during the lecture. Thank you very much and an applause for Professor Stone. Gosh, um, Mr. Ambassador, uh, Director, um, Professor Fekri, Fekri, my friend, um, ladies and gentlemen, um, what an introduction. Um, I can only assume that I will not live up to everything that has been said about me, um, but I will do my best. We are talking um, about something that, as everybody has said, is a extremely important and extremely topical um, issue. My um, talk is based on two roles that I have. Um, firstly, on the left of the slide, my UNESCO role as a, um, a cultural um, ambassador and a cultural um, uh, professor. And on the right-hand side, um, the emblem that some of you may not recognize, but of the Blue Shield. Um, and the Blue Shield is an organization I will talk more of um, as this uh, presentation goes on. But the um, UNESCO part of my work, I think, is summarized in the quote that is there on the, um, on the slide for you. And of course, um, those of you, uh, well, all of you, I'm sure, will recognize those as being the first words of the UNESCO Constitution. And I think we have to frame our response to any damage of cultural property in that much broader um, issue and international agenda. So that's the UNESCO context in many ways. The Blue Shield context is perhaps slightly more precise and slightly more um, focused, um, and it is simply this. When they burn books, they will, in the end, burn human beings too. And if we can stop people destroying cultural property and cultural heritage, then we have some chance of stopping people um, waging war and fighting. A slim one perhaps, but it is there and it is something that we cannot not address. We cannot not try to do something. This is an extremely topical um, issue as many of the speakers have already said. But who would have thought in the 1990s or 1980s that in um, this decade the UN have um, passed in the Security Council, not one but four um, resolutions that relate to the protection of cultural property and heritage. Um, I'm not going to go into them in detail, but the most astonishing of all of these is from the Security Council of the United Nations, a document that comes out not about security per se, not again about international relations per se, but on the destruction of cultural property. The United Nations see this as such an important issue that they take the time and the effort and the profile to put this central into their work. And the others all have implicit agendas within um, the uh, area of destruction of cultural property. And that's a key part of what I'm going to be talking about because I stand in front of you as an archaeologist and heritage manager. However, the protection of cultural property is far more important than just for archaeologists and heritage people. It is for everybody. And we need to work that and we need to understand the issues surrounding that. It's very topical also because of the work that UNESCO has been doing. 
um, and the 2003 Declaration on the Intentional Destruction of um, Cultural Heritage um, and others that you can read there. We've already heard about the 2016 Military Manual um, and the strategy that UNESCO have developed in 2016 and revisited at the uh, recent General Assembly um, uh, in Paris last week and the week before. And there is now a, a modified version of that um, available. And not least and least, um, the um, uh, creation of my own particular UNESCO chair in cultural property protection and peace. For those of you who don't know the system of UNESCO chairs, there are about um, 650 chairs around the world dealing in any of the activities of UNESCO. We are not UNESCO members of staff. We do not speak on behalf of UNESCO. Frequently, um, I certainly find myself as a critical friend of UNESCO, trying to encourage um, the organization to work in particular ways that may be the most effective ways. But we are that additional element within um, the whole world of academia. But I suppose we should start partially at the beginning um, with Iraq in 2003. And this is where I first became involved in um, the whole of this issue. And the depressing part of this is that nobody had taken the protection of cultural property seriously in the um, planning for the invasion of Iraq that happened in um, 2003. In 2002, the Americans set up six um, so-called think tanks committees um, to plan for post-Saddam Hussein Iraq. One of those had a subcommittee to look at culture, and that committee never met. So as a result of that, there is no surprise in a way that no combat coalition troops had any orders to protect anything cultural. And if an army officer doesn't have an order, then nothing gets done. These places weren't even marked on military combat maps. When my um, late colleague Donny George, the then director of research at the National Museum in Iraq, um, went to plead with the American troops to go and protect the National Museum, the museum wasn't marked on their maps and he had to show them where it was. And there was an extraordinarily limited um, expertise about culture and cultural protection in the whole of the coalition. Depending on how you count that, um, it is probably um, achievable to count it on the fingers of one hand in the number of personnel. And one of the things that happened in 2003 was what the British military coined a phrase of catastrophic success. They had planned for the um, invasion of Iraq to take six months and that it would be a very horrible, nasty, quite possible chemical war. They were actually, coalition troops were actually in Baghdad within less than three weeks of the beginning of hostilities. And what that took away from um, the military was the ability to plan in that six months of conflict for the post-conflict scenario. And one of the things that it meant was that those troops in the coalition who did have some expertise in cultural property protection were still either in Kuwait, hundreds of miles away, or mostly still in America, thousands of miles away. They simply hadn't been deployed because nobody thought they were going to be necessary um, for the next six months. Also, and we've heard about the 1954 Hague Convention, the two main protagonists, the US and the UK, neither had ratified the convention or either of its protocols. That was an astonishing failure um, on behalf um, of both governments. The US have finally ratified the convention, but not the protocols in 2009. And the UK ratified all three parts of the convention um, in September 1917. I had been arguing since 2003 for the 
British and with the British government that they should ratify all three parts very quickly. And one of the reasons I kept saying was, and you will be the first country on the permanent five of the United Nations to have ratified all three parts. They didn't take that opportunity quite quickly enough, um, and I'm in a way very pleased to say that France beat us to it and um, was the first on the permanent five to have ratified all three parts. Egypt, however, beat everybody to it and had ratified um, the first two parts in 1955 and the second protocol in 2005. So what did this lack of preparation do? Well, it was very simple, really. It allowed the looting of every museum in Iraq and libraries and archives, and it stimulated and allowed for the mass looting of archaeological sites in Iraq, in particular, although not exclusively, in the south of the country. An appalling situation. So what did go wrong? Well, firstly, there were not enough troops deployed to do the job that anybody wanted them to do. When Donald Rumsfeld called the American um, chiefs of staff in to go and invade Iraq, they said, we don't have to do that, sir. We have plans to invade Iraq. All we need to know is what you want as the political objective and outcome for that invasion. What we can tell you is that the minimum number of troops that we need to invade Iraq to do anything is 300,000. The coalition eventually invaded in March, April 2003 with 148,000 troops. And that was a, an invasion, therefore, with less than half the military minimum requirement for the operation. And as one American general said to me, he said, um, sir, if you invade with less than half your numbers, then if you have 10 priorities, the bottom five are not going to be done because there are not enough troops. And then he smiled benignly, and as the way most American generals do, because they're all very big, he patted me on the head and said, and sir, I'm not telling you that cultural property protection was in the top 10. And of course it wasn't. There was a complete and utter failure to understand a whole range of post-conflict scenarios in Iraq um, by those mainly American but not entirely um, planners. And there was a complete failure to understand the importance of cultural heritage and religious buildings and sites um, that could build into um, the po possible conflict scenarios in post-2003 Iraq. And in addition, there was a complete and utter um, failure to understand the lessons of history. If you could identify one army in the world not to be deployed in the Iraqi city of Basra, it would almost certainly be the British army because of the history of the British army in southern Iraq and in Basra. And of course, that is exactly where the British army was deployed. So we have just lost all connection with these issues. But there was one more and one more critically important issue that we got wrong in Iraq. And that was the failure of the heritage community, people like me and I guess yourselves, to interact with the military. We failed the cultural property, we failed the cultural heritage, and we failed the people of Iraq by not managing to do that. People frequently ask me or complain that I put um, protecting objects and old things and old places and old lumps and bumps in the ground more important over um, protecting people. And the question must be asked is, are historic objects as important to protect as people? And the categoric 100% answer to that is extremely simple. Absolutely not. The crisis that we face and have faced in um, the Middle East over the last 10 years or so, and the crisis we face at the moment is this, the crisis of the Syrian and other affected people. But the issue with protecting people and not protecting heritage is that the two are almost indivisible. 
heritage is kept within people. So why is it important to protect cultural property? Firstly, without memory, we are severely limited. An individual without a memory is frequently referred to as a dysfunctional individual, somebody who needs help to survive from day to day. A community or society without a memory is equally potentially a dysfunctional society or community. And that memory is held in the cultural heritage and the cultural property, both tangible and intangible, within that society and community. And it is the people who hold and can unlock the understanding of intangible cultural heritage and living heritage from the um, mute stones and objects of the past. Cultural property becomes the stage on which much cultural heritage is acted out, much of that intangible cultural heritage, where, and it provides communities with a sense of place. If we allow those places to be destroyed, then um, the whole of that community becomes threatened. Allow me a, a brief tangent and uh, anecdote. I was on um, the um, east coast of Japan um, uh, a year or so ago in a village and um, a small town that had been badly damaged by the tsunami and the, um, the uh, earthquake and, and everything that followed um, that. And the government was bringing in, um, was rebuilding the road, was putting in the infrastructure, the water, the electricity, all of those things. The local community, though, were rushing to make sure that three buildings were still protected, supported, um, and, if necessary, rebuilt. And these were the three main heritage buildings and bits of cultural property in that small town. One of them was a three-story wooden building, which had been picked up and moved about a quarter of a mile away and deposited as a two-story wooden building by the tsunami. The local population, ignoring everything that the government was doing, moved that building back to where it should be. And so, it, so the um, government couldn't change the road system because it had to be acknowledged that this building, so important to that community, was there in the right place. And they are in the process now of rebuilding it and putting the third story um, back on. So it's crucial there. I tell my students that we study the past and culture so that we can understand the present, so we can begin to um, help build the future. If we don't have the tangible and intangible links to that past, that um, beneficial circle gets broken. But why is cultural property important? And there's a list there, and you can reassure yourselves, I'm not going to talk about each one of those um, at any length. But the point is to make that when, in 2003, the coalition forces failed to protect cultural property in Iraq, we argued with them and shouted at them and criticised them, but mainly from an academic and a cultural and a social point of view. And we completely failed to begin to understand their role and their responsibilities. In other words, right down at the bottom there, the military reasons for why cultural property protection is important. And over the 10 more years now since that invasion, I have probably spent time every year, two or three times a year, talking to different people in uniform. And they have consistently been very polite, um, listened to me, smiled as they showed me the door, shut the door, and must have laughed together saying, that man is mad. We are not going to do anything about anything he said because he's talking about how important that archaeological site is or that historic building or whatever. That's got nothing to do with us. It was in 2013 that I had a, um, a light bulb went on and I realized that we had to essentially invert this list 
and start from where the military um, need and think in those terms. So why is cultural property protection important to the military? Firstly, and believe me, and astonishingly I found out, um, they take um, international law extraordinarily seriously. And in the planning of any military campaign, nothing gets dealt with, nothing gets decided until it has been checked by a lawyer. And that legal responsibility is critical because it's there to protect cultural property in um, what we've heard in the military manual, the laws of armed conflict, or more commonly, international humanitarian law. It is a legal responsibility. It is there under, uh, increasingly, um, the international human rights law. Um, two years ago, um, my phone went and I answered the phone and at the other end there was somebody who I never even knew existed. And this was the special rapporteur for the United Nations for cultural rights. And um, she was just taking up post and she wanted to make um, a, the, the right of individuals to their cultural heritage and their cultural property a universal human right. And um, she is working that process through the UN system at the moment. It's there as a legal responsibility under international customary law and also under international criminal law. So the military are tied by the legal ramifications and increasingly those legal ramifications are being taken um, seriously. One thing that we have to remember is the military don't go to war. They don't decide to go to war. In fact, they are the last people usually who want to go to war because many of them have been there before and it's very not a very nice place to be. The military are sent to war by politicians and they need to understand the um, rationale and the ideas about why they are being sent to war. They need to know and they need to understand the economic importance of cultural property. Because one of the military issues that I've found is that, yes, they all want to win this mission, whatever that mission is, but then, most importantly, they want to go home quickly, and they want to go home with as few casualties as possible. And the American plan in 2003 was to have all of their troops back in America by Christmas of 2003. It took them another 10, nearly 11 years to extract themselves and they're not completely extracted yet. And the reason for that was they could not deliver a stable economic country. And if you look at World Bank statements, depending on which part of you are, but uh, which part of the area you're in, but for the Middle East, nearly 70% of tourism is um, the mainstay of uh, cultural prop uh, sorry of um, the economy and of that 70 percent quite often 60 or 70 percent is based around cultural tourism we've heard that there are issues around the looting of sites and museums put across to the funding of the enemy there is the post-conflict stabilization period that economic issue that i've talked about and then something that the military call um, force multiplier or a soft power and there are good examples of this and bad examples and I'll come back to that in just a moment but of course all of that has to be phrased and regarded in military terms with the military mission as the primary focus so a good example of a force multiplier or a bad one Camp Alpha um, created by the Americans and the Poles in 2003-04 on top of um, the ancient city of Babylon. And you can just see here um, one of the trenches dug by the American military um, in the building of that site to then create a, um, a safe, secure environment for their troops. And what they would do is take all the material from this, put it into great big, effectively, um, uh, material bags, um, about three meters by two meters, and these would then be a barrier behind the ditch to protect the camp. Of course, this is not a very good thing to do if the World Heritage Site on which you're building your camp 
is uh, predicated mainly on the below ground archaeology. The American military um, accepted that they'd made a terrible mistake and so the next small camp they went to, they um, didn't um, dig a trench, they uh, just put a HESCO barrier, these big bag barriers, um, and they went out into the desert to fill um, that with the sand. Of course, what they did by doing that was they destroyed an archaeological site in the desert, brought it back, and contaminated the archaeological site on which they were creating um, the second base. The American military, you know, try their best. All militaries try their best, but it comes down to us to educate them, and we need to do that. Many of my friends say, um, but Peter, it's war. Things are going to get damaged. Things are going to get destroyed. There are two answers to that. Firstly, if you go back two and a half thousand years to one of the um, major military strategists in China, Shenzhou, who is still regarded and is still used by um, big corporations for business management today, he states very clearly that the worst thing a military can do is to allow cultural property to be damaged, or worse, to damage it yourself for any group that you are thinking that you're going to occupy or defeat. Because if you do that, you are creating the next reason for the next war. So that process is there all the way through, and it comes to the Lieber Code in the 19, uh, sorry, 1863, where for the first time, um, a uh, legal basis for protection of cultural property was developed during the American Civil War. And that has been uh, repeated by numerous Hague Conventions, culminating in the 1954 Hague Conventions. So, military theorists have been saying that allowing cultural property to be destroyed is madness, and yet we've been doing it for the last two and a half thousand years. But do we have to? Do things have to get damaged? Can't we do anything? And this is why I introduced the second logo, um, the Blue Shield. The emblem of the Blue Shield is mentioned as a protective emblem in the 1954 convention. The organization works within the broader context set by the convention, by the UN, and by UNESCO. We deal with all cultural property. We were created as an international organization in 1996 with international committees, and we were reconfigured in 2016. We're non-governmental, non-profit, independent, partial, neutral, and I now have to put the word in mainly, which I'll explain later, voluntary-based. And um, we are frequently called um, the cultural equivalent of the Red Cross, a question again, I will come back to. So what lessons have we learned since 2003? Firstly, yes, of course, people first, and that must be the message that we put across. Um, but we must work with the military, long, medium, and short term. We must understand military constraints and priorities. We mustn't tell them that they've done something wrong. We mustn't shout at them, especially if we haven't told them what they should be doing. We need to work with them as partners. And just to sort of emphasize the scope of the Blue Shield, um, this is an officer in the uh, Cambodian army um, who have a Blue Shield um, unit um, in the Cambodian military trying to protect cultural property um, whenever they are deployed. The Blue Shield works in six areas, and I will just touch very briefly on all of these in the, in the remaining time. Um, Firstly, developing policy and principles. We are, astonishingly, really starting from scratch. What do we want the military to do? What do we need to tell them? How do we need to tell them? All of these things we haven't really understood ourselves. We need to coordinate the Blue Shield, but we also need to coordinate with all of the other relevant organizations and potential partners. We try to develop what we call proactive protection. Again, I'll come back to this. Training, emergency response, and long-term support. 
So let's just take each of those very briefly in, um, in order. Policy, interaction with the military. We need, and this was my um, light bulb moment in 2013, um, we need to explain to the military the times that we want them to um, have training in cultural property protection. So firstly, long term, everybody who puts a uniform on needs to know that in extremis, saving cultural property may save their lives. I don't say that in an exaggerated way. There are numerous examples where that um, failing to save has at least caused casualties, if not fatalities. Secondly, and, and that first level needs to be rank appropriate and responsibility appropriate. Secondly, we need um, specific pre-deployment training before any military is deployed into any country, be it their own or a different um, country. And that is, what does the cultural property of this country look like? Who are the key players in it? Who are the people that you should be trying to talk to very quickly? Thirdly, is during conflict. The military don't want people like me in theatre, as they call it. I'm the last person who wants to be there during a conflict. But they need the ability to ask questions, to distinguish, and this was um, done very clearly during the Second World War, to distinguish between two um, military uh, concepts, military necessity and military convenience. So if it is absolutely essential that you blow up that historic bridge or that you destroy that historic building because there is no other way of achieving the object, that's military necessity. And um, uh, Field Marshal Eisenhower in the Second World War sent um, a memo round to all Allied troops just before the invasion of Sicily and Italy and Normandy saying, if it's really necessity, then fine, go ahead and destroy it. If, however, and this was the steel fist in the velvet glove of Eisenhower, if you blow that thing up because it's just easier, because it might save you an hour or whatever, if that becomes military convenience, then I, the Supreme Allied Commander, would like to talk to you. And that threat maintained and protected a huge amount of cultural property in those um, countries. And then finally, post-conflict, the stabilization phase um, is critical um, so that we don't lose the initiative and the um, energy. Of course, I'm here saying the military, but the military is not one thing. It is many, it is a many-headed um, hydra. So every military in the world divides up their operational activities, their activities, under a number of headings. These are simply the um, NATO's headings. So every one of these areas is a NATO area um, that they deal with. Each one of these needs interaction at those four times, but they need different interaction. They don't need the emphasis um, and interestingly, you will see that the one thing that I assumed that would be there in these nine areas was the legal aspect. And when I question that, the uh, military officers just laugh at me and say, no, the legal aspect goes through all of this. And that's exactly the position that I am advocating cultural property protection should do. It should go through all of this. So intelligence gathering needs to think about cultural property protection. Targeting. All targeteers are very um, uh, used to creating what are called target folders. Why that building is a legitimate target. That quite often ends up in a deep um, file, um, inches thick, which legitimizes and gives a legal credibility to attacking that particular place. What we're working with the military on now and the target is, is creating non-target folders in exactly the same process, but these are things that you must not or cannot or at worst should not target. 
And at the top of those are those properties protected under the Hague Convention, which you must not damage, even if it is military necessity. So we need um, nuanced training, nuanced input into all of those areas. Um, there is no point in training somebody for civ uh, civil military work in the same way as you train a targeteer. They are completely different soldiers. Just because they wear a uniform doesn't mean that they need the same training. Okay, go back to that point. It's war, things get destroyed. Well, yes, it, they do, but we've worked um, out that there are at least seven different risks to cultural property during an armed conflict. And if we don't address each of those and try and mitigate the risk in each of those, then we're not going to do anything. But if we do work with all of those and try to mitigate them, then we will mitigate the overall threat to cultural property. So very quickly, lack of planning. Go back to 2002. Nobody had that in mind. Spoils of war. European armies used to pay their troops by allowing them to loot. That doesn't happen very often anymore although go into almost any military mess and ask yourself them, um, um, any military barracks and ask yourself that question as well. Um, but it doesn't often happen. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't happen in other parts of the world. Lack of military awareness. The people who were creating Camp Alpha shouldn't have dug a trench, but they should have been told that they shouldn't have dug a trench. They need to know that. Yes, there is some collateral damage, and I will come back to that um, later. Looting is an issue that is um, a, a terrible one and undermines all of the protection of cultural property. There is what we call enforced neglect, when people like myself and probably yourselves cannot do the job that you normally do because of the conflict. So if you can't get to your site to make sure that it is okay or that it has its six month review or whatever, then that site will slowly deteriorate. And then of course there is specific targeting, um, what Daesh and others are doing at the moment, but in fact has been an element of some conflicts for hundreds and hundreds of years. And we shouldn't forget that. We shouldn't forget, for example, the European Reformation did exactly what Daesh are doing at the moment. But that specific targeting is perhaps one of the most difficult areas to combat, although there are um, elements of that which I'll come to in a moment. So that's the sort of policy work that we're doing, and I will um, speed up. Coordination. Um, within the Blue Shield is something that I will leave aside, but I've been working since um, 2006 with a NATO organization called the CIMIC Center of Excellence, which is based in the Netherlands, and CIMIC um, stands for Civilian Military Liaison. And we eventually worked that they produced a 78-page quick read, it's two hours read, lots of pictures, lots of graphs, um, publication for all NATO um, officers mainly. It's a free download um, and they have uh, produced thousands of these. It took, as you can see, from 2006 to 2015 to write this. I could have probably written it for them 95% in 2006, but the huge value of this publication in that it wasn't written by me or anybody that looks like me it was written by people in uniform for people in uniform. It had taken me that um, nearly 10 years to get the people in the Simic Center of Excellence to understand what I was talking about, so they wrote the publication. And as such, from military officer to military officer reader, that message is far more important and far more understood. Let's just go back to collateral damage. One of the things that we um, have done as Blue Shield um, over the last 10 years is produce lists of cultural property that we would prefer, if at all possible, were not damaged during a conflict. 
I did this for um, Iraq in 2003, and there were about 36 sites on the list only. Um, it's been done since then, um, again for Iraq, for Syria, um, for Mali, and for Libya, and for Yemen. Um, and we are doing other um, lists as we speak. What we are trying to do is show that property doesn't have to be damaged if the military targeteers know not to damage it. So in um, the NATO air campaign in Libya in 2011, um, a NATO targeteer sitting in an airfield in the Netherlands um, identified from, I think, satellite imagery, it may have been a drone, I don't know, um, that there were six vehicles of a mobile radar unit that forces loyal to President Gaddafi had put right next to and inside a derelict building. And so the targeteer identified that as a site um, for, as a, um, a target for one of the next operations. That then went through the now electronic system of the target folder, and I don't know the detail of what happened, but the equivalent of a red light flashed on his or her computer screen. Because the coordinates for the building were the same coordinates for a Roman building that we had put onto the Blue Shield Please Don't Destroy list um, and given to um, the Americans, the British, and to NATO. And so the decision went up the military um, uh, hierarchy and somebody decided that they would therefore, what in military terms they call, modify the ordnance. So in other words, instead of dropping one large bomb to destroy all six vehicles and the building, which had been what the initial target here had said that they would do, they used six precision weapons to destroy the six vehicles, but not the building. That is one of them. That is the Roman building behind. The other five look exactly the same as that um, tangled heap of metal. Each one of them was destroyed completely, and the only damage to the Roman building was minimal shrapnel damage. Yes, there is collateral damage, but it doesn't have to be if you plan for it. And that is um, what we are trying to do. As a result of that, NATO got something that they are um, incredibly, um, uh, is incredibly unusual for them to get. They got a lot of good publicity. Um, and that was shown to be a good thing from um, in press all over the world. And as a result, NATO set up their own internal inquiry to find out what they'd done right. And that inquiry um, ended up um, in December 2015 with the premise and the, the main recommendation that NATO should create its own cultural property protection policy. Now, for those of you who understand NATO, that's an astonishing statement because NATO relies not on NATO-level policies, but on the policies of all of the countries who are part of an individual deployment. To have a NATO-level policy is one of, the, one of the very few, and so this is NATO really beginning to understand the importance. Now, we haven't got there yet, they don't yet have this policy, but we are still working with them to develop it. One of the things that I um, am convinced that we need to do, and this onus comes onto the heritage community, not onto the military, but is be ready for the worst. We need to be ready to um, understand what cultural property we have in a country, where all the sites are, where the museums are. Um, when we are asked about producing a list, we can usually tell them very well um, where the archaeological sites are. We can usually say where the museums are, or at least the national level and regional level museums. It is almost impossible, interestingly, to tell anybody where all of the archives are. You might have the National Archive registered, but that's all. We have no idea, apart from, again, the National Library, where all the libraries are. We don't take that into consideration as the cultural heritage sector of this being important information in case of catastrophe.
And that catastrophe can be natural catastrophe, it can equally be military catastrophe, conflict. We worked with colleagues in Lebanon to develop the whole project to try and develop this in Lebanon. Um, and the idea of that was Lebanon is a relatively small entity that we could um, do that relatively quickly and relatively cheaply. Um, we put applications into a number of places and as yet the response we always get back is this is too ambitious. It may be ambitious but it is what is necessary. And one of the things that we, we one of the organizations we put money into, well, oh, sorry, we put an application into, we got no money out of, <laughs> subtle difference, um, is the UK's Cultural Protection Fund. That's a 30 million pound fund that, to my mind, and okay, I'm being recorded, but they've heard me say this many times, that is being badly spent. It is being spent on individual sites on individual projects that probably would have been um, attempted to be funded without the pressure of conflict. It is missing the point. It is um, dealing with the causes, uh, sorry, the symptoms, not the causes of um, what we need to do. Aleph, I hope, will take this whole initiative more seriously and look not at the small scale, but the ambitious and the big scale. And I know um, colleagues in Aleph are preparing the, the whole documentation for that, um, which we hope will be out next year. And we hope that that will have a far more um, focused idea on what is needed as proactive protection, not putting sticking plasters on places um, that may have been damaged already or that may be um, coming uh, under threat. That's a huge opportunity. And I think now the Aleph um, Fund stands at 75 million euros. Um, that's fantastic. But actually, 75 million euros, 30 million pounds, isn't very much for trying to deal with what the level of um, the urgency that we need for proactive protection. Training. All of our training rests on the things that I've talked about already. Um, so I won't go through this in detail, but you can see it there. It rests on understanding the end user, effectively, what the military need from us, not what we as the community tell the military they should do. That will never work. We have to work from the agenda that the military have. And all of that, all of Blue Shield training, um, uh, is stems from that. The fifth area is emergency response. The Blue Shield has done very little on this because we have very little funding to do it. We've sent small groups of three people into Libya and to Mali um, immediately post-conflict and in fact during the conflict um, on a second uh, visit to Libya. There's still a very long way to go with that and I won't go into that, but I, um, the slide there um, you may recognize as a very proactive reaction, not only of the employees of the Ministry of Culture here and of the museum, but also behind them, the Egyptian army protecting um, the National Museum a few years ago. So the Egyptian military have got a lot of this understanding and attitude in their minds already. And um, I would love to be able to sit down with them, um, and I hope this will happen um, in the next few months, um, to begin to work from their good practice so we can disseminate some of that good practice um, uh, regionally. Long term, I won't go through again this in detail, it's talking about everything that I've talked about so far, um, all of those elements, but crucially also the legal aspect. And the legal aspect has um, two in well, positive developments. Firstly, um, we've already heard that Mr. Ramadi um, was sentenced to nine years and with an astonishing 2.5 million euro um, fine for destruction of nine mausolea and one mosque in Timbuktu for which he was responsible for. Um, that happened uh, now 18 months ago. Um, and uh, Mr. Almadi is, is there in um, the uh, prison in The Hague. Um, I got news yesterday 
um, that uh, an Iraqi court in Mosul has sentenced um, somebody to death for um, a range of activity um, that they took part in as a member of Daesh, including the destruction of the cultural property in the museum in Mosul. Um, and there you have Daesh being very um, kind to us because part of, I understand, the uh, prosecution case was the video of the man um, destroying the cultural property. So it was a pretty cast iron case. Now, I may have um, issues with the death sentence, that's a totally different issue, but there are two legal now precedents um, over destruction of cultural property. So are we the cultural equivalent of the Red Cross? No, probably never in my lifetime. But we are working towards that, and I will carry on for the rest of my life working towards that. We now have, and the reason we had, I had to put mainly voluntary in the earlier slide, Newcastle University, who funds my salary, and they have now given me funding for one and a half additional staff um, to work with me on this um, work. And um, that's fantastic. One of the people, um, the point five post, is an art historian. He um, has a PhD in art history. He, um, his art history work is mainly relating to the um, uh, iconography of uh, military soldiers in Germany from 1914 to 1939. That's what his PhD, and I promised him I'd plug it. His recent book, which came out last week, is on as well. However, that's not his value to me or to this project because he had an earlier career um, and he left the British Army as a lieutenant colonel. And Paul and I are now able to do um, a sort of good cop, bad cop um, team where I talk in the way I am talking this evening to a military audience and they will sit there in polite silence but thinking, you know, this guy, yeah, I get a bit of what he's saying, and, but... Paul will then come up and start talking a language that I simply don't understand, which is termed military language. And they all sit up and suddenly realize the relevance of what I've been saying actually to their mission. And Paul's value in that is just astonishing. And um, we, um, as one example of that, I was giving a lecture to the US um, Air Force um, Paul came in, um, in fact, by Skype, um, and as a result of that um, dual um, attack, um, we are now, the American Air Force is now um, adding two cultural property protection scenarios to a major war game that they are doing um, in Eastern Europe um, next year. So this really does come through. Is this important? Is it still an issue? This is a satellite image of a site that many of you will know um, in Syria, uh, Apimia, um, taken um, in 2011. Eight months later, the same satellite went over, and that is the same image. Each one of those dots is a looter's hole. That major Roman city is now almost no longer viable as an archaeological site. And there is an awful lot of that going on, not only across the Middle East, but in parts of Africa um, and elsewhere in the world. It is an astonishing thing that we do need to address. Is it still important? Ask these two archivists um, in Timbuktu, um, looking at the remains of one of the archives in Timbuktu that was destroyed uh, by Ansandia. Um, luckily, probably 90% of the archives in Timbuktu were got out of the city before the occupation happened and are now safe. But this is what happens. Is it important? Absolutely. This, I think, is... Um, captures an awful lot of what we say and think. Um, and allow me just to read it to you. We expect people to die. We count on our own lives to end. 
The destruction of a monument to civilization is something else. The bridge at Mostar, in all, is all its beauty and grace, was built to outlive us. It was an attempt to grasp eternity. It transcended our individual destiny. A dead woman is one of us, but the bridge is all of us forever. Now, the bridge that you see there is actually the original bridge. The new bridge has been replicated, but it's not the same. It has not been walked over by generation after generation after generation of people who lived in Mostar. The value of cultural property. Our ambition is simple. We know that we are never going to stop war. We can, though, perhaps in partnership, influence how it's acted out. And that's not that different to Henri Durant's um, view of the Red Cross initially. We may, by getting the military to understand the protection of cultural property, make their job slightly easier and certainly less destructive. At the same time, we may help achieve um, some evidence and keep that evidence of human history, both tangible and intangible. That's not a bad ambition. It's one I'm dedicated to. And my final slide, um, if you will allow me, I said earlier, people first, and I said earlier that nobody should put their life in the way of protecting cultural property. However, there are a number of colleagues who have done just that. And um, this slide is now very sadly out of date. But I'd like just to dedicate this to these colleagues from the General, General Directorate of Antiquities in Syria, who have all lost their lives trying to protect cultural property. And I can't stop doing this work knowing that they have made that sacrifice. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for listening. Well, Professor Stone, I would like on behalf of all of us, I think tonight really warmly thank you for this brilliant and stimulating uh, lecture. It's really uh, a fantastic fantastic work. Thank you very much for doing this work and I think it opened a lot of uh, ideas and opened a lot of ways for uh, all of us here. Thank you again very much. Um, I would like to invite all of you uh, to uh, maybe have a discussion um, but mostly enjoy our garden and some refreshment in the garden, then this would be the opportunity to meet you and others here. Thank you very much for attending to all of you, and I wish you a good evening. Thank you. Thank you.